well, it sounded to me like you believed what you were saying. Does anybody, do you, like, how great is our God, eh? Is he great? Really, really, he's top of the line. He's great. Well, I'd like us to pray, first of all. Paul, thanks for leading us this morning. Are you new here? <laughs> um, thanks for seeing. It's really great to just look around and to see all of your lovely faces and um, to know that we're here for a purpose, right? To worship our great God, who really is great, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that our, the whole God, right? He's wonderful. So I'd like us to pray. I'd like us to pray for the kids who are away, uh, although we've already prayed for them. I'd like us to pray today for people who are wrestling with emotional, mental uh, issues and anxiety issues. I don't think we've done very well as a church over the years of exactly addressing this. In many ways, we've sort of said, oh, well, you're a Christian. You shouldn't have any anxiety about anything. Uh, cast all your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you. You shouldn't be anxious. What's wrong with you? And we sort of dump guilt on people who are already struggling with stuff, and nobody asks to be anxious. Do you know that? I say, oh, I think I'll be anxious today because I just need something to do. That never is. It's something that comes on you. Well, I don't have to preach to you about this. I want to pray about it. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come to you because you're great and you're your love has reached out to us. You're the prime mover. You're the first one who reached out to us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. You came here seeking us out. You're, you're the seeker, seeking relationship with us because you want to lead us into the life that you have for us, the good life, the abundant life, the life that actually tastes. We have tastes of your presence and tastes of of heaven even at times. So I'd like to pray today, Lord, for our young people who are away. I ask that you will meet with them in powerful ways and that you'll really fill up Matt as he speaks to them this weekend and you will do deep, eternal work there. I'd like to pray, Lord, for the men and women who are wrestling with mental and emotional things. And Lord, would you remind us that you're the God of love and mercy, and you are the very present help in time of need. You've told us we can come boldly to the throne of grace and find help in our time of need. So Lord, would you please break in us the, the, the false bravery that teaches us that we alone are enough. That without you and without your people and without your gifts and your help, that we can even survive. Destroy the powers of shame and isolation that keep us from one another and keep us from you, Lord. That make us slaves to falsehood, really, believing lies. And... Uh, would you weed out of us this Canadian individualism that insists that we've got it all covered, we don't need anybody else? And Lord, give us the assurance, I pray, that we can seek help when we're anxious or struggling with mental or emotional issues, Lord. From you first, we can get this help from, from, because you're our high priest greater than all, and our helper. And Lord, that we can also ask for help from others, our brothers and sisters in this community. And help us to know, Lord, that you are the healer and that you often use like medication and, and therapies and treatment and accountability and friendships and community to help us. So Lord, we give ourselves to you today. We pray that you will lead us as we look into your word. Open our eyes. Help us to see the wonderful things in your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, so 
Would you open your Bibles, please, to the book of Hebrews? We're going to be looking in here again today. We're on a, a walk through Hebrews, and we've come to a very interesting passage of Scripture that many of you have looked at before in different contexts. And just as you turn there, Hebrews 6, 4 to 12, um, there we are, hold, held firm to hold fast. What does this mean? What's, where did this title come from? It means that God is holding us firmly. It's God who holds us firm in order that we can hold fast to him. He's the one who empowers us and strengthens us so that we can be faithful to him. And so, have you ever wondered whether you can lose your salvation? Has anybody ever wondered this? Okay, we have a few hands go up here. Um, the scriptures say, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. Is the fear of the Lord the end of wisdom and knowledge? Or is there something that we grow into? Do you think God wants us to tremble and be frightened and even traumatized and paralyzed by fear? How does the fear of God stack up with the idea of coming boldly to the throne of grace? Well, I think we're going to talk about some of these things today. So, we'd like to read this scripture together, and I'm wondering if you would stand and start reading this with me. Okay, we'll all stand. We're standing for the reading of the Word of God um, because it's the Word of God, and we have huge respect for the word of God. So let's try reading this together. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again, and subjecting him to public disgrace. Now, this is a passage of Scripture that's often used by our friends who say that you can lose your salvation. You can lose it. So, we just keep going. Whoops. Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed, receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are convinced of better things in your case, the things that have to do with salvation. Did you hear the change in tone? Sort of like this real sternness, right, about this thing. And then he says, okay, even, so, even though I'm saying this, my dear friends... We, we're convinced of better things with you. Uh, the things that have to do with salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end so that what you hope for may be fully realized we do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Okay, thanks. You may be seated. So when we take a look at this passage of Scripture, we read this first part about these, these people, and we say, like, are these Christians? Are these, are these like, are they really Christians? And uh, so we go back and we look at this first passage of Scripture, these who, um, who have tasted, who, who first of all have been enlightened, who've tasted the heavenly gift, who've shared in the Holy Spirit. We're going to look at these as we look down. They've tasted something. They've been enlightened. It seems like they've been together, at least with other believers, and they've seen something of the goodness of God. 
they've tasted the heavenly gift. Now, this is hard to interpret. I'm not sure exactly what it means, but because it's not defined in the text. But I think it means that these people have been together with other believers, and they have um, tasted something of what it means to be together in fellowship with other believers, where there's love and unity and people growing and this kind of, they've seen this happen and they've tasted some of it themselves. They've shared in the Holy Spirit. And what on earth does that mean? That they have been, it's the Holy Spirit who gives us our fellowship, right? So they've been present with other people and they've sort of shared in some of the experience of this thing. Maybe what they've done is when, the, when people have been worshiping and raising their hands and just singing, how great is our God, some tears come to their eyes and they say, oh, wow, well, that's quite amazing, eh? Or they have tasted the goodness of the word of God. They've been present when the word of God has been taught and preached and they say, oh, you know what? That, that does make sense. And the final thing is they've tasted the power of the coming age. Now, the coming age is when Jesus comes back again. We just sang about him when he comes back again. As an aside, do you think he could come today? Huh? Yeah, he could come today. I mean, Jesus could come at any time. There's really nothing that has to be done before he comes back again. So he could come at any time. And these people somehow have had some something taught to them about what it's going to be like when Jesus comes back, and they've sort of been thinking, well, that would be neat. Well, how could, I had somebody, I was talking with somebody about this, how could this not be salvation? How could they not be saved here? But I'd like to just ask you to notice if you, if there were any missing terms in the description of this group of people. Like, for example, did you see the term born again? Did you see the term salvation? Did you see the term having received eternal life? They're not there, are they? What about this Holy Spirit thing? There's a beautiful scripture in Ephesians chapter 1 that talks about being sealed by the Holy Spirit. Do you see anything here about being sealed by the Holy Spirit? I'm just asking you to look at the Bible and see what it says. Well, because being sealed by the Holy Spirit is it, what Ephesians 1 says, when you believe, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And a seal is something that seals you up so you can't get out, <laughs> which means you're saved, Right? But that's not in this description. And so the missing things here, the missing terms are really, really important for us. Does this make sense? So, um, is it possible that these people have been in close proximity with born-again believers and have kind of enjoyed it and thought it's really, they're a nice group of people to be with, really? And they've tasted some of this thing, but they've never made it their own. So this is what appears to be happening. To taste, to feel the emotional effects of being with people who are worshiping the Lord. I remember a lady came into our, our church, um, and she sat at the back, and when we started to worship the Lord, she just started to weep. And she came up to me after, afterwards, and she said, what is this all about? Well, I, I don't know why I'm weeping. I say, you know what? This is the Holy Spirit stirring in you. And, and, and do you know the Lord like this? Do you want to know the Lord? It's possible to have an emotional experience before we really need the, before we meet the Lord. Does this make sense? It is. So anyway, this is what seems to be happening here. These could be church members even who have somehow felt the power of the gospel and tasted some experience, but um, they've never really made it their own. So they're posturing, if you know what I mean. They're, they're taking the posture of a Christian, but they're not really born again. 
John 1.12 is a really, oh, this is a helpful verse. This is where Jesus said that he came to his own, those would be the Jewish people, but his own received him not. But to everybody who received him, to those who believed on the name of the Son of God, which is Jesus Christ, he gave the right to become sons and daughters of the living God. There are three verbs there. Believe, receive, and become. Which means we, we believe, we know something, and we believe it to be true. But you know the weird thing about the Bible is that it says that even the demons believe in Jesus in the sense of knowing that he exists. Do you, do you know? They know he exists. They believe that he exists, but they have not received him into their life. They've not trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And there's a big difference. So it's possible for people to know a lot about Jesus and not have received him as their Savior and the Lord of their life. So this is the issue that's really coming through here. When we believe in Jesus and really receive him into our life, we become daughters and sons of the living God. That's a miracle of new birth. That's the thing, we're born into his family. And so it seems that these dear people knew some things about Jesus, but they've never become disciples of Jesus. They've never become followers of him. They've never been saved. They were real close. But then they found themselves moving away and finding themselves even at a place where they, if we could just go back here for a second, that, um, this one, oh, this one, <laughs> this one, that to their loss, they're cruci you see the bottom, they're crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. It's like they're saying, you know, I was up real close to these Christian people, but now I'm moving away. I don't, I don't think so. Actually, they're sort, they find themselves like the people gathered around the cross when Jesus was hanging there for our sins and saying, come on down from there if you think you're so great. You know, they're mocking Jesus and sort of like crucifying him all over again. I don't want to be there. So, missing terms. And this brings us then to the big, big question. Uh, is it possible that we can lose our salvation. And this is introduces for us this uh, $10 word, hermeneutics, which means interpretation. We can read the Bible. How do we interpret the Bible is a big thing. We know what it says. What does it actually mean by what it says? And a, a, a couple of the really important things about hermeneutics is this. It's really the same thing, that the Bible interprets itself. That Scripture best explains Scripture. It's really dangerous to take one passage of Scripture, yank it out of its context, and this is, this is all we have. So we have to use the, the, the wholeness of Scripture to interpret any piece of Scripture. I hope that makes sense. So anyway, this is a big, big important part of hermeneutics and how to interpret. So... If we're asking the question this morning, is the writer saying that you can be truly saved and then lose your salvation? Even if we had this, and remember that some of our dear brothers and sisters in this world think that you can lose your salvation, we're asking the question this morning, are there other scriptures that, that inform this idea? So let's look. I've got a few. I'm going to move really fast. John 5, 24, very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has, now what tense is this? That's grammar, okay? What tense is that? Present tense. I thought somebody said very tense. <laughs> it's not has eternal life and will not be judged. You're not going to be judged. But has crossed over. It's like here's death and there's life. And we're not over here anymore. We've crossed over to the life side. We have the life of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in us. Um, so anyway, I asked Ruth about telling this story. She said, go for it. 
Ruth was raised in a church where you could lose your salvation. And if I could quote her, she would say, my brother and I were brats. She said almost every Sunday night, we'd walk the aisle because we knew we needed to get saved again because we'd blown it so badly during the week because we were brats. Well, do you know, that was difficult because she had to keep going back to the elementary things. Do you remember last week we were talking about this? Do we keep going back to the elementary things or do we move on and grow and mature? And she wasn't able to do that because she had to keep going back. To, oh, gee, I've got to get saved again. Now, um, when we were newly married couple, we were in a Bible study and um, we were reading through Ephesians 2 and we came to verse 8 and 9 and 10. And it just, a load lifted off Ruth. I wasn't preaching to her. I wasn't teaching anything. The Holy Spirit was present as we looked at this word of God. And the scripture said, for it is by grace that you're saved through faith. And that's not from yourselves. It's the what? It's the gift of God, not by your works, lest anybody should boast. And she looked at that. She said, you know what? I've been on a performance treadmill trying to work for my own salvation, and I lose it. I fall off the treadmill. I get back on again, and this is very tiring. Um, and it was like a load lifted off her at that time. And do you know one of the byproducts? She got a hunger for the Word of God like never before. She just wanted to gobble this stuff. The grace of God sets us free to begin to grow, to really grab onto the salvation and run, run with the Lord in a beautiful way. Okay, so I got to move pretty fast here. Let's go. John 6, 37. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. You could say, well, you, you, he won't drive you away, but maybe you could jump away. It's sort of like, well, you get in the boat with Jesus, and he's never going to kick you out, man. You, you get out of the water, out of the trouble, and now you're in the lifeboat, and you're going with Jesus, and he's never going to kick you out. He's going to take you to the destination. And someone may say, oh, yeah, but you can jump overboard if you want to. And somebody else on the other side will say, but I tell you what, if you're drowning out there, and you get in the boat, and you're actually with Jesus... I mean, Jesus is so incredible, who would ever want to jump overboard if you really know him? Um, Romans 5. So the Apostle Paul in Romans, he goes to a lot of trouble to assure people that they have eternal life, that we've actually changed from where we used to be. We now have eternal life over here. So this one, therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a lot more there, but do you know what justified means? It means that God declares you righteous, and he treats you that way. That's pretty amazing. He declares you righteous. That's fantastic. Romans 6, what shall we say then? Should we go on sinning? So you may say, well, okay, if you, yeah, but if you think you've got eternal security, then you're going to say, oh, I can just live any old way I want because I got my ticket to heaven. Salvation is not a ticket to heaven. Salvation is a new life with the Lord Jesus Christ, which includes a ticket to heaven. <laughs> so, we, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Absolutely not, he says here. This is actually a double negative in Greek. It's really, really, it means absolutely no, like that would be stupid to do that, right? We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? And there's a lot there about baptism, which is really powerful. Romans 8, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Never condemned again. That sounds pretty secure to me. Uh, Romans 8, the spirit you've received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. You know, there's a fear 
of me. Oh, man, if I make a little mistake here, I'm going to lose my salvation. It's like God's up here with a baseball bat. He says, okay, you step out of line, and I'm going to get you. Okay, you're not going to heaven, man, if you make a mistake here. Does this look like God to you? God has not given us a spirit of fear. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship and daughtership. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. I had a friend who went to Israel, and uh, when the person came back, I said, what was one of the highlights for you? And she said, well, I was in a market one day, and there was this little toddler kid just going along, and he says, and, and the little toddler is going, Abba, 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 Abba. And this guy picked the little kid up and just gave him a big bear hug like this. And my friend said, like, this is how it is with us and God, isn't it? We just call him Abba and we run to him and he picks us up and he helps us in our time of need. We call him Abba Father. Romans 8, these two verses say that you're never alone, right? Who's praying for you? in 8.26. Help me. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. What about in 8.34? Who's praying for you there? Jesus. <laughs> um, uh, Jesus is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Jesus is praying for you. The Holy Spirit is praying for you to keep you strong and to keep you moving. So Romans 8, knowing all these things were more than conquerors, I'm convinced neither death nor life, and you know this verse, nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 1 John 5, 11 to 13, a lot of you know this verse, but anyway, whoever has the Son has life, whoever does not have the Son does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may guess that you have eternal life so that you may hope so, so that you may dream that maybe you might possibly have. What's it say? You can actually say something, okay? <laughs> so that you may know that you have eternal life. God wants us to know this and to hang on to it. Oh, I love this. John 10, so this is the clincher then. My sheep listen to my voice, this is Jesus speaking. I know them, they follow me, I give them eternal life, they shall never perish. No, no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So our kids, we have four kids and then some foster kids. But I remember when our kids were tiny and they were toddlers and just not quite walking yet, I would give two fingers to the kids like this. And, and uh, let's say our little daughter, Julie, She'd grab onto this finger with her whole hand and hold on tightly, and then I would take my hand and wrap it all the way around her hand. Are you with me? So I'm like this, and she's holding on, and my hand... <laughs> can't remember how to do it. <laughs> so anyway, I've got her, but she thinks she's hanging on to me. You get the picture? Now, if this is a, I love this. I would not let her fall. I'd pick her up and we'd start walking like this. Come on, honey, you can do it. Yes, you can. Let's go. She thinks she's hanging on, and she is hanging on for all her might, but I've got my fist wrapped around hers, hanging onto her. And you are doubly held because Jesus has got you, and God the Father's got you as well. And my inkling is that the Holy Spirit's got you as well. Although it doesn't say so in the text. So, anyway. Uh, so here's the conclusion. Almighty God strengthens believers to keep on following Jesus and to persevere. He really does. He's got a vested interest in you. And he's there to help you and to keep you going Almighty God does this. He's really amazing. The next part of the passage is that God wants fruit, though. He wants fruit. And so there's this warning here in verses 7 and 8. Land that drinks in... 
the rain often falling on it produces a crop. Um, it receives the blessing of God. So this is just an agricultural thing. It makes sense, doesn't it, right? You're a farmer. You've got a field. You plant your seed. It grows a crop. You say, okay, that's great. you got another field. You plant the seed. All you get is weeds and thistles. You're going to do something to that. That's, you're not planting it to get weeds and thistles. There's going to be a judgment over there. And that's his illustration that, that says that God wants fruit. Now, what's the fruit that he wants in our lives? Well, for one thing, it's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. This love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. How are you doing on that? Faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. God wants to produce this more and more in our lives. But he also wants our lives to have an influence on other people in the world that we help them turn toward Jesus by our actions and by our words, speaking the truth to them. And so Ruth and I have a friend who's actually a relative now by marriage who he was going through an awful divorce. His wife had left him with two little kids, two years old and four years old. And so here he is, he's a broken man. And so he goes to work and he had a buddy at work who listened to him for a while and finally said to him, you need Jesus to help you, man. You can't get through this on your own. Would you come to church with me? And he went to church and his story is the second time I was there, I had an epiphany. He said, it just came crystal clear to me. Jesus is actually God. And he can actually come into my life and help me. And save me. There was fruit. This other believer had the boldness to say, Would you, you need Jesus. Would you come to church with me? So here then, after all of this, here is a great encouragement that he changes the tone of the whole thing. After this big warning, you don't want to be this person who gets up real close to Christians and then walks away and finds yourself lost like that. His huge encouragement, even though we speak like this, we're convinced of better things in your case. The things that have uh, to do with salvation. And look at the words that he's using here, like, I'm confident. Um, God is not, is the word confident there? <laughs> convinced of better things, uh, things, he will not forget your work. Well, anyway, it's in my Bible, my translation. Confidence, it just reminded me of Philippians 1.6. Having this confidence that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion till the day of Christ. There's a confidence here. Uh, he uses words like things that accompany salvation or things that have to do with salvation. Yeah, you've received your salvation. There, there's fruit in your life. There's a changing uh, stuff in your life as you go. And, uh, and God is not unjust. He's absolutely faithful. He'll not forget your work, your service, and the love you've shown him. He uses words like diligence. Does he? <laughs> Through faith and patience. Oh, we don't want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. So that's his assurance to these believers that they're really walking with the Lord and they're going to keep on walking. So, the great expectation here is this, that you will keep on keeping on. God expects this. He's going to empower you and he's going to make it happen. And so, therefore, don't stop. So, I'm going to end with four questions. And here we go. Does God want us to fear and worry and stress over losing our salvation? You're answering this in your mind right now. The answer is no. God wants us to have an assurance that we can know that we have eternal life. And this morning, if you're not sure that you have eternal life, would you talk to somebody? Would you email me this week? Would you talk to one of the leaders or one of your Christian friends and say, how do you know this for sure? Because this is really important. Question number two. When you're going through a tough time, maybe emotional, mental stress, anxiety, 
You can't even pray. Now, you're just struggling. You are low. You are down. Does this mean you've lost your salvation? Does this mean you've walked up and, and you've turned away and you're re-crucifying Christ again? Even when you have doubts, what do we do? Don't hide. Don't run away if you're in the midst of this. Come out. Ask the questions. Ask the tough questions. And keep moving forward because Jesus Christ is with you in the midst of the anxiety and the difficulty. And he wants to walk you through. And I think what you'll find is that as you sink down in de depression or anxiety, you'll find that underneath you is the solid rock. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. He's with you. Question number three. How do we treat people who, who seem to have fallen away? I bet we all know somebody, right? Who was here at one time, has gone away and said, ah, I don't believe that stuff anymore. How do we treat them? Well, for one thing, we don't know for sure what God's doing in their life. Is this true? We really don't. So we don't judge them and we don't condemn them. We love them and we engage with them, and we ask them when we can, look, whatever happened? How come you kind of, you know, like what disappointed you about Jesus? And they may say, well, I wasn't disappointed with Jesus. It was the Christians, actually. People condemned me, and, you know, they just, whoa. And you could say, you know what? I've been disappointed with other Christians, too, at times, and with the church at times. But I've never been disappointed with Jesus. Consider him again, honestly. Consider him again. And the fourth question. Uh, maybe you're here this morning and you say, you know what, I've been up close to a lot of Christians and maybe I've turned away now at this point. Um, and that verse said that it's impossible to come back to repentance and I think it's impossible for me now. Can I say this? If you're asking that question, you're not one of those people. Because asking that question is the work of the Holy Spirit in your life that's saying, don't run away. Come back. My arms are wide open. He's saying, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. And you may say, yeah, but the Bible says it's impossible to turn back. Do you know what? With God, all things are possible. I think there is a point of no return, actually, when a person resists, 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 resists so much, they may have just burned so many things behind them they can't get back. But I tell you what, you never know when that has happened. And if, you, if there's any inkling in your heart to say, oh, Jesus, I need you, that's the Holy Spirit stirring you and calling you to him. So open your heart to him. And for many of us here, I know, the, you love the Lord. You've got assurance of salvation. And um, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work, your labor of love, that you've shown him as you've helped his people and served his people. God is faithful. So keep on. Well, my time's up, but I, I've got a story, so I'm going to go ahead and tell it, and you guys will forgive me, won't you, because you're Christians. <laughs> All right, it's the story of a guy by the name of Paderewski. He was a, a pianist. He traveled all around the world. Maybe you've heard the story before. So he's in a certain place, which I don't know, and uh, people are coming to hear his concert, and the grand piano's up on the stage and so on. And so there's this mother who comes in with a little kid about six years old who's just started playing the piano, and the mother's teaching the kid piano. And she sits in the front row, and the little kid's sitting beside her, and she starts talking to her friend beside her, and the little kid gets up and walks up onto the stage and sits at the piano. And he only knows one song, and it's... What's the name of it? Dun, dun, chopsticks. 
dun 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 so he starts playing chopsticks and you can hear people in the in the audience right saying what is that kid doing up there where's his mother and his mother looks and it's my kid and in the meantime paderewski is out out on backstage and he hears this thing happening and he comes out and he leans over the little boy. And as the little kid's playing chopsticks, Paderewski is improvising up and down like this. And he says to the kid, he says, don't stop. Keep going. Never quit. I am with you. And together, we're going to make beautiful music. And this is the truth of the living, resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. You may feel like your life is chopsticks at times. The Lord Jesus Christ knows you and loves you, and he's going to be playing over you, and he's, going to make, and he's making something beautiful of you. Do you know that you are loved like this? Do you know this? Oh, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your good news. You don't cast us away. You'll never cast us away. But you have arranged for us to know that we have eternal life. I pray for every one of us this morning as we heard your word and we trust, sensed your Holy Spirit stirring in our hearts that we'll respond to you and let you have your way in our hearts and lives. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship together.